so I'll get started. Um, I want to talk today about building reliable systems in JavaScript. Uh, you may, on the schedule, it says, uh, the title of the talk says, um, the art and science of uh, suspending execution. But I decided to change the talk a little bit just because there's been other talks talking about asynchronous JavaScript. Um, so I decided to kind of zoom out a little bit and explore the subject that led me to, uh, to think and talk about concurrency in JavaScript. And the, and the idea of, of building reliable systems is, is the one that comes to mind. Um, I am, my name is uh, Amjad Massad. I am tech lead on the JavaScript infrastructure team at Facebook. Um, we we um, uh, develop and maintain a lot of the core um, tools, developer tools and infrastructure uh, for everyone at Facebook. And so, so what do I mean by reliable systems and why is it something that I'm, I'm thinking about? Um, there are, if you go to the Wikipedia page or if you Google it, you'll probably find a lot of talk about the subject, but for the purpose of, of this talk, um, I'm going to define reliable systems as a system that is maintainable, that is testable, that is scalable, and that is uh, fault tolerant. I guess uh, a lot of people talk about the first three, but not a lot of talk about the, the last one. Uh, and I'm not trying to talk about backend programming or server programming in particular. I'm trying to talk about just uh, building systems in general. And that usually includes um, server, client software, um, and anything in, bet in between. So before I get into it, traditionally we think about uh, building uh, software as, as front end engineers as this um, this program that we build, and if, if something fails, it's just an error. You know, we can we can uh, have the page hang or, or do the wrong thing, and people report the bug, and then we can go and fix it. Um, but I think more and more, uh, as I grow as a software engineer, I, I I'm uh, I'm getting to the point where um, I believe that software will fail; it will have bugs, but we need to do. Uh, the best job that we can in order to prevent them, but also to recover from them once we uh, once we hit that error. Um, increasingly, a lot of what we do as as JavaScript developers is becoming a distributed systems challenge because if you're thinking about your um, single page application, you have a lot of different. Uh, widgets on the page, a lot of different processes, and, and they could be talking together. And if one failed, you don't want everything else on your page to fail. If the chat application in Facebook fails, you don't want your newsfeed to fail. At the same time, we're, uh, with all the new web APIs that we're having, web workers and things like that, we're starting to uh, do uh, things like mes message passing. And when you're talking to the server, you also have to synchronize the state between the client and the server. Um, and with all these opportunities also becomes the problem of any of these components could fail and we should be able to, to recover from that failure and we should build systems in order to do that gracefully. So I'll start with a, with a simple one. I'll go over it fast, but um, code structure has, has uh, something that's been I've been thinking uh, about for a long time, and it keeps coming up every time you design a new project. How can you design, how can you structure your code in a way that is testable and maintainable? Uh, and I think the, there's been a lot of talk about dependency injection, uh, but a, a lot of the times, I personally get confused when uh, all these elaborate frameworks is built around dependency injection. So I'm going to simplify it and just say prefer interfaces. When you're, when you're building programs, when you're building modules and components, um, expect that whatever thing that you depend on will be passed as an argument, and then you have certain um, um, assumptions about the interface of that object that you want to deal with. And that will increase the testability and the flexibility of your system. So, uh, for example, let's take a contrived example, um, a class called expensive and that class is passed in a cache object. 
Um, and when it does something expensive, it will go um, try to get it from cash first. If it couldn't get it from cash, it will, it will do that thing and then put it in cash. Now, in production, I can have different sorts of caching mechanisms. I can have an in-memory cache, I can have a Redis cache, I can have, I, I can have no cache at all, maybe for testing purposes, um, and maybe I want to mock the cache for unit testing. So in all these cases, whatever uh, thing that I built should just work because it's, I'm only expecting a cache object with a get method on it. And that increases the flexibility of your system and makes it really easy to test. So I think tests are a liability as much as, as they, are, they help us. Um, at Facebook, we build this thing uh, called Jest, and Jest is a testing framework that allows you to, that auto mocks everything that you require. So anything that you, you require in your app is automatically uh, instantiated, and then will mock all the methods, and that's what get, gets passed to your to your app. But what ends up happening is that you have um, you have to basically mock every single thing in your app, and that that becomes a real pain and that becomes um, a liability, Every, you'll move a lot slower because of these tests. Every time you want to change something that is internal to your code, you end up having to change all the tests that, that um, uh, all, the, all the mocks and all the, all, all the tests that you've already written. So um, when you're thinking about mocking and we're thinking about your modules, try to um, uh, draw the seams at, at a reasonable level of abstraction. So if you think of your modules as a tree, um, don't t test every leaf node uh, on its own and don't test every node on its own and mock everything around it. Try to find a, a conceive, you know, a, a reasonable subtree and say all these modules beyond this subtree is, is a package and I'm going to test this package as, as a single unit. Um, one thing to always do is to mock external dependencies because well, what ends up happening is if you're depending on a database or a file or, or a file system, you end up having uh, flaky tests and you end up having uh, real pain to deal with. So group modules um, with its internals. So um, I guess this part is, is kind of the meat of the talk and it gets at the original title of the talk. So a lot of the failures that I've seen in, in my um, in my career in, um, in, in software engineering uh, are things that are race con based on race conditions and, and what I'm calling state races. Um, basically something, we have certain assumptions about the systems or the program that we're writing and when we get um, something unexpected, uh, our system will, will go into a bad state. Um, and a lot of the problems in that is because of JavaScript's uh, lacking in the domain of, of concurrency constructs. Um, so um, when I first joined Facebook, I was on the Photos team. And I remember the first um, project that I was working on was to, um, to make our photo upload reliability better. It was basically there was a 10% chance that any person uploading photo, photos from a desktop browser, uh, that it would fail. So 10% is huge in uh, Facebook scale, right? So that's like millions and millions of photos. Um, and we discovered, uh, we, we uh, in six months we raised, we raised it, um, we decreased the, the failure to 3% only. And uh, I think half of those came from problems in race conditions problems from, from callbacks and, and um, just because of all the bad abstractions we had around concurrency. So I'm going to take an example to just illustrate uh, what do I mean by concurrency, what do I mean by um, uh, what certain tools and abstractions that we have to make this better uh, for us as JavaScript programmers. So this example is a really simple vending machine. You can call it the one cent vending machine. Um, it, 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 it does one thing only. You insert a coin, you select an item, all items are uh, priced at one cent, and then it will uh, dispense the item and then uh, return the change for you. So the change is basically the amount, uh, uh, the number of cents 
minus one. So basically, if you insert a coin, uh, if you in insert a quarter, that's 25 cents. You'll select the item, and then you'll get 24 cents in change. That's it. So, so if I, if I want to formalize it as, as kind of a state machine, this is a, like, or Zudu code. So if I want to write this in Zudu code, it's, it's really simple and easy, and I can, I can write it really easily. First of all, I want to assert that the machine is not broken. Simple. And then I want to wait for a coin. After that coin is inserted, I want to wait for an item select. After that item is selected, I want to try and dispense the item. If, if that failed, uh, I'll set a variable called change to the original number, uh, to the original amount of cents that the, that the user uh, gave us. Um, and then I'll try to return the change. Um, if we couldn't uh, return the change, then we consider that the machine is broken because we're basically swallowing people's money. So that's a, that's a, like a, um, a fatal failure. And we'll ping the admin or whatever vending machines do. Um, so simple enough. Um, so let's make the assumption that the machine is 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 um, super. Uh, it, it does it doesn't fail. Everything is works great in it. So the way I would implement it is I would have a class called vending machine. Um, it would have a method called coin, and that's called from uh, from the external. Um, world, basically when you insert a coin, that method is called, and it has the amount of sense that that, that coin has. So when, when, when coin is called, I will set this dot sense to the number, the amount of sense, and then I'll wait for a select. When someone selects an item, I will, uh, I, I have, let's say I have a magical, or I have a, something that is already in my class called uh, item dispenser, I will try to dispense the item and that is a asynchronous method. So I'll call that on the item, and then um, w w once that succeeds, I will return the change. And the change is basically this dot sense minus one. Um, this is very simple, even simpler than the zero code. So JavaScript is winning here. Um, however, uh, you, you may no notice an important problem, especially if you're a Node developer, is that um, we're not handling any errors. So the first thing we need to do is add error handlers. So after we add error handlers, now uh, we call item dispenser, and I know I have a misspelling of dispenser here, but don't worry about it. Um, and we, we handle the error. Basically, we call a method called break. So the machine will break once we have an error. So this is actually a wrong implementation because in the original specification, we said the machine would only break when we can return change. But in this case, when any error happens, we'll just break. So that's a wrong implementation, but it's also still missing a lot of things. So um, one thing that I can think of is that I can insert a coin multiple times and then it would only take the last coin that I inserted and everything else would be gone. It would basically be uh, stealing money from people, right, if, if someone inserted multiple coins. Or what if someone's left something without paying? Even worse, you go up to a machine, you select something. If you look at this code, it will just dispense the item without even checking anything. So we'll add code to handle that. So if we don't have any sense, um, then it will, the machine will break, which is still bad and wrong because you know you can't you can't have the machine break every every time something unexpected happens. But you know let's go with it for now. What if something? What if someone selects something twice? What if they actually added the money but then they selected something twice? So. Um, so in this case, it will dispense it while, so we call the dispense method and then we're waiting on the callback to happen. Uh, this duration, it, this is a big opportunity for race conditions to happen because if we get another select event, then uh, we'll be dispensing the same uh, item multiple times without asking for the money. So what if someone adds a coin while we are dispensing? So in this case, we need to, hmm. 
um, we, you see in the, in the third line, we added another F statement. If we already have sense as state, then, then the machine would break saying that we're already processing a coin. So if you insert one coin, you can insert another coin. You insert another coin, the machine would break, which is also wrong behavior, but we'll go with it for now. So th there's still a race condition here. There's still something that, that could go uh, wrong, um, something that we haven't anticipated. Um, and uh, in this case, if um, I actually forgot the race condition here, but uh, I mean that's a good uh, demo of how how hard this is. This is really hard. Uh, I think the race condition is. Yeah, processing coin uh, to basically not allow uh, people to select multiple events, more, select items multiple times. So basically, we have multiple states now. Uh, processing a coin when we're already in a, in a in a process of of processing a coin and dispensing an item, and then another state, um, uh, and and then we set that to false after we finish everything. So that kind of guards the entire process. Someone inserts a coin. We set processing uh, coin to true, and then and then we don't accept any more events unless it's a select event, um, and 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 I think that that should work, but um, I mean that's that's a problem. I mean I don't know if it would work or not. There's a lot of potential race conditions. Imagine now if if one of the component fails and it calls one of our callbacks twice. So that is also something that we need to protect against. We're passing this call back to the item dispenser and could do anything to it. It, call, it can call multiple times, it can call three, four, or five times, you never know. And there's no error recovery in this. It's really hard to add error recovery in this type of code. There's also no queuing logic. So if I insert multiple coins, oh, the machine will just break. If I select multiple things, the machine will just break. And I think it's ugly. It's hard to test and maintain. So, um, Here's a quote unquote complete implementation. This will this is actually an implementation of a state machine. I'll have a state variable that I'll start with idle at the top, and then um, whenever something happens, um, I'll set the state to the to the state that that, uh, that it needs to be in. Uh, and I'll have a queue where I insert the coins, uh, where where it queues up the the coins. So every time we add a coin, we just check if the state is not broken, and we push um, push the coin to the queue. We have a dispatch function, and that dispatch function checks if it's not idle, then we shouldn't do anything. If it's idle, then we should um, uh, pop one off the queue, pop a coin off the queue, and then we set the state to wait for select. And then we expect the select item. Of course, anything that happens, any anything that happens, uh, if if, so, if someone inserts a coin, it will just get queued up, and we'll wait for the select. And the select will have all these guards against these these wrong states, and finally we'll we'll dispense the item. So that's uh, fairly um, a good implementation, but it's still has a lot of problems. It still has potential races. It, I, I don't know where they are, but they're probably there. Um, and one thing I know that if a callback is called multiple times, then that's definitely, it will put my machine in, in a wrong state. It will probably do the wrong thing. It is still ugly, and it only has coin um, queuing. It doesn't queue the select events. So if you insert a coin and you select it multiple times, it will put, put the machine in the wrong state. So, I'm not sure uh, how many of you guys are uh, familiar with uh, ES6 promises. Okay, so most of you, uh, those who, who don't, it's basically um, uh, like callbacks, but um, instead of passing a callback to some asynchronous function, um, you basically get a handle. And once you get a handle uh, for that, um, uh, it's called a promise because uh, that asynchronous function w uh, promised you to deliver you some value in the future. And then in the future, that promise will materialize into a value. And the way that happens is by calling then on the promise. And then and that's how you get at the value of the promise. 
So this implementation uses, uh, uses promises. Um, it has an internal state promise called processing. We start with that uh, processing uh, promise being resolved. So, um, so it's basically the promise is, uh, has a value of undefined, but it is resolved. And then once we have a coin insertion, what we do is we wait for any processing that is already taking place by using this dot promise dot then, and then if that succeeds, then whatever coin we inserted here becomes the, the, the uh, becomes this dot sense the amount of sense that we have, and if it's an error, we'll we'll handle the error later. Um, I'll talk about the error handling later, um, and we set the original processing state to the to the uh, to the value of of the new promise. And then when someone selects an item, we also do the same thing. We wait on the, the current processing uh, promise uh, here, and we set the original processing promise to that value. And this, this is much better than what we had before, but it's still, it's, it's still kind of ugly. It does the right thing. Um, uh, it 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 has it ha it's declarative. It automatically queues operations. So we have operation queuing on both select and end coins. Um, uh, defines dependencies between operations. So we we automatically wait for whatever is happening. Um, it's easier to test, but I I say it's so ugly. It's um, it might have potential races. I don't know. It's still convoluted and still doesn't do, doesn't say what it's trying to do. Like you can't read it and really figure out what's, what's happening. You have to go and, and, and really stare at it for, for a good amount of time to really figure out what's going on. So um, there's this, this um, project called uh, csp.js. Um, csp stands for Communicating Sequential Processes. Um, it's a paper by Tony Hoare, was written in, in the 70s or something. And then uh, basically nobody, oh, maybe it was popular in the academic world, but nobody in industry was using it until Go came uh, in 2009 and they implemented the, the, um, uh, the paper as part of the language. And the paper introduces uh, two important things uh, called um, a channel and a go routine. Uh, channel is basically um, a handle where you can send things on. It's basically message passing. And a go routine is a function that would run asynchronously and can interact with these channels. Um, in this implementation, the coins is a channel. The items that people select is a channel. And we have a main run loop in this uh, run function that I'll talk about in a little bit. When a coin is inserted, we just check if the machine is broken. If it's broken, we just return an error. If it's not, we put um, a coin in the, in the um, I don't know if you guys can see good. We put a coin, we put a coin in, the, in the coins channel. Uh, same thing for select. We put an item in the items channel. So here's our main run loop. It starts with while one, and that's usually a good sign that, that the program is, is readable because the machine should run forever unless it's broken. So uh, we take an item off of the, of the we take a, a coin off the coins channel, and that acts kind of like a queue. And it's a blocking queue. So this function will block until we get a coin. So the machine will start, it will hit the first instruction, it will block. Until someone walks up to the machine, puts a coin in, it will move to the second instruction. Now let's take the, the scenario where someone comes in and puts two coins, three coins, four coins, all these coins are buffered. We're just handling the first coin. And then we'll wait for an item selection. So they'll select an item and we'll move to the, to the third instruction. And 
the item selection um, can also be queued. Someone could be pressing something a hundred times. It doesn't matter. It will be queued and processed later. And then we set um, the change to cents minus one because everything is is one cent basically. Um, and then what we do is we dispense the item. It's this statement over here. And this is a go routine. I'll expect other component engineers also uh, adopting CSP and Go. So uh, we'll take from the we'll take from the channel that was um, created by by the item dispenser, and that would that would act as a result. So the result could be an error. They could have returned an error. If it's if if it is an error, then I'll log. I'll say to the user, error dispensing item. And then I'll change. I'll set my, the change to the original amount, so I can return to the user the original amount of, of cents. And then I'll do the same thing. I'll call the, the coin dispenser to return the, the money to the user. And now, if that fails, I'll return from this method. So the, the, this this um, this is kind of like a break. This will return from the, the entire while loop, and this will break the machine. Because you know we, we we couldn't change we couldn't return the change and we consider that a fatal. So what uh, what we're doing here is we're setting the this because um, this happens only if that go routine stops. When that go routine stops, we know that there's an error. So we set a state called broken error uh, to that error, and then that will be checked every time. So. I think this is an amazing implementation. I think this is queuing works for selects and coins. It reads exactly similar to the Zuda code that we written, if you noticed. It handles queuing. A state is local, and this is something that I want to emphasize uh, when I say state is local. Basically, um, when you look at this function, everything that you need to execute your state machine and to execute your algorithm is inside that function. So there is no state dangling on the object or somewhere else where something can get at that state uh, and, and change it. So this is a very important concept that I'm finding is that whenever we can localize the state, that's the best thing that we can do. So um, this, is, this, is, uh, this is really sums it up. Coroutines are to state machines what recursion is to stacks. Recursion is a very powerful tool. And when we learn that in, in school or, or on your own, it feels very powerful because you're taking this thing that you have to spell out to the computer and it does it by itself, right? You just sit, declare what you want to do and recursion will take care of that. Um, uh, and so you don't have to have stacks. Recursion will take care of that. Same thing here with coroutines. Um, we have a state machine, but we just we just don't have to keep all these different states. We'll just write our algorithm exactly like we wanted to write it, and it'll just take care of the rest. So coroutines uh, is a general uh, name for any function that pauses execution. This is the original title of the talk. Suspend, suspends ex execution. So uh, this is what I mean by a coroutine. So a coroutine could be a CSP implementation, could be generators, it could be coroutines like in Python. So um, in, in, um, in the new version, newer version of JavaScript, uh, ES7, we have something called uh, async await. Um, it is um, a type of coroutine mechanism, although a little bit, um, it's, it's not as flexible. But it's built on ES6 generators, which are coroutines. So um, uh, this is an implementation for a future kind of JavaScript. The previous one worked in ES6. This one you need ES7 for. So it's the same thing. We have the main run loop, uh, and we have two inputs, the coin and, and select, and we check the broken error and all that stuff. Uh, but instead of being uh, the run loop being a, a coroutine, a generator, uh, this time the run loop is an async function. So we start the, the run loop here, and then if the run loop um, errors out, we set the broken error to that to the result of that error. So the run should run forever unless there's an error. Here's the run loop. It's also very elegant. Maybe a little bit more elegant than the other one. Um, 
I have to point out something. I'm not using regular promises. I'm using uh, something called promise queue, and I'll show you an implementation. It'll fit in the slides. It's just promises, but but can can queue things up. Um, so it's the same thing. You know, first instruction: wait for the coins. So we're using we're using the keyword await. So await can can take it's a keyword and can take any promise after that and will block execution until that promise is resolved. So we wait on the queue, and once it, it, something is inserted to the queue, we'll pause the execution. Uh, well, I mean, we'll continue the execution, and we'll do the same thing for items. So queuing is built into that. And we use try catch. One of the things that async await can give us back is, is um, language features that, that are uh, basic, like try and catch. Yeah, I miss try and catch, you know? Uh, when I started uh, programming JavaScript, you can't use them because everything is asynchronous errors. So, so I was happy to use try and catch again, <laughs> as weird as it sounds. So in this case, I'll wait uh, for the item dispenser to dispense the item. And if there's an error, I will log this error. I will set the change to the original amount. And, and, and then I will try to return the change. This should be change, by the way. Um, this is wrong, but it should be just the, the variable change. Um, and then if that failed, then we throw the error. And notice we can use throw again. Uh, we throw the error, and that will set the, the broken state uh, of, of the machine, and that will make it broken. Um, here's the implementation problem skew. I'm not going to talk about it. It's like literally like one slide. It's, it's very simple. So async await implementation, I think it's beautiful. Um, I think it's uh, easy to reason about and test, and we, we can really uh, implement the entire algorithm in a, in a slide. Um, and you know, going from from that uh, original promise code or that original state machine code to to this, I think is a is nothing but pure win. And 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 I, I think this is something that that will change, that will make our products, people writing in JavaScript, that will make it more stable and it will make it more reliable and will uh, make it less error prone if if we all adopted these things. So uh, this sums it up for for um, uh, the problem of, of race conditions in JavaScript. Another thing I, I want to talk about is uh, errors as values. Uh, so we've all written this code. This is a, uh, you, you know you execute a query. You have to handle the error, but you don't have time for it. You just handle the result, and you add it to do handle error, and then you ship it to production. And oh god, no! Destroyed the joke. Maybe we don't have connection. We do. I don't know why it's not playing. Anyways, this should be a Jeff. Yeah, I had to play it. <laughs> this is what happens when we ship it to production. Um, and then, um, this is actual code that I've seen. I'm not kidding. I've seen this. I'm not going to say the name of the company. It's Yahoo. Um, I was working there, and I've seen this code. <laughs> um, and it kind of looks like this, right? <laughs> what kind of engineers do that? It's, um, so, so the history of errors in JavaScript is, is really bad. I mean, um, uh, this is how we think about errors, at least how I thought about errors. Um, something unexpected happened. Um, I'll deal with it later. It's probably not going to happen. And uh, if you've seen Toby's talk about, uh, about making assumptions and about these things, and a lot of times you're sure that this would not happen, and then it will happen. Um, and we just log and fail if it happens. So I mean, that's a not reliable system. If an error happens, that you always die. Um, this this is an amazing quote. Um, I'll just read it. Uh, if the probability of something happening is one in ten to the thirteenth, how often would that happen? Your natural human sense would be to answer never. That is an infinitely large number in human terms. But if you ask a physicist, she would say all the time, in a cubic foot of air, 
those things happen all the time. When you design distributed systems, you have to say failure happens all the time. So when you design, you design for failure. It is your number one concern. Um, and and I, I think the analogy to to like um, to air um, is in a cubic foot of air. I think it's it's on point. When we think about programs, we think about these these simple instructions and these simple processes that we look at. But in reality, it runs millions of times. And in millions of times that it runs, the chances of, of something that, ha that, that has a low probability of happening, it will happen every day. So one thing that I started doing in JavaScript is uh, using error types. So instead of throwing new error, I'll actually extend the, the base class error and have error types. And this will help me ha handle the error according to the type of failure. Because different types of failures require different types of handling. Um, and that uh, allows me to handle the errors at different type, at different levels of the stack. If I am at a component deep and I throw an error, maybe I want to handle it somewhere, somewhere uh, really at the, at the top level of stack. It also has better visibility in the logging. When you log, you can you can really figure out where that error is coming from, instead of just ch uh, chasing stack traces. Um, you can also have uh, user facing versus uh, internal errors. So that's really good for web server development. Um, you can actually specify errors, and then, then users will see errors that make sense as opposed to everything being internal errors. Um, and um, it can be used as part of a protocol, and this is something I'll, I'll get to in a little bit, but um, I think errors should be considered values, should be considered part of your program. You should just accept the fact that errors will happen and then handle them every time and use them. And maybe you can implement algorithms that Errors are part of the core of the algorithm. Um, performance is, a, is another thing that um, is important for reliable systems. So performance, I think, is a very large topic to talk about. So um, I will only focus on a few parts of it. So in, in, in JavaScript, my experience in, in making things performant is after doing the first pass of optimizations, um, I'll start putting things in workers because that's the, 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 the way we do parallelization in JavaScript. We have web workers. Web workers are basically a separate process uh, that, that you start and then you talk to via message passing. Um, so in Node, this is also forking. So you can fork a process in Node to do a certain uh, set of uh, a certain computation. So when you program uh, JavaScript and you want to create a system that is scalable, um, Make sure that when you're creating the, your objects, you have ser serialization always in mind. Uh, think about all your objects as at one point in time will be serializable and will be uh, will, will have to be uh, transported over the wire or between processes or something like that. It will be used in messaging, basically. And it, embrace the idea of message passing because that's how we do parallelization in, in, in JavaScript. And then uh, remember what I said about error types? This is really important here. When you have a, a component or a module that uh, does certain errors, um, you, it, it's, it becomes incredibly important to know about these errors when you're doing the work across different processes or across the wire. So uh, a few gotchas uh, when, you're, when you're starting to parallelize work. Um, Sometimes the cost of deserialization or serialization will be higher than the than the um, than the savings that you have from from forking on to a different process. So always measure that. Sometimes you want to use something other than JSON. You want to use a different, maybe a binary encoding, so you can get a better serialization here. File system races. This is this is the worst thing that that can happen to you. Um, basically, when you fork off two workers, and let's say they both uh, read from the same disk cache and they write to the same disk cache, this is how. Like, they could, be, um, they could be writing to the same file, they could be deleting the same file, and a lot of weird things will happen. So what, one technique you can do is, when you want to write off to cache on disk, write it to a temporary directory. And then copy it to the to the place that you wanna you wanna put the cache in. And that copy, if it fails, then you can back off. It's a single transaction as opposed to uh, writing an entire file.
Um, and uh, caching is another thing um, uh, to think about when building your libel systems. Um, uh, think of cache as as the just only cache the results of computations or in other words have your cache always be reconstructable meaning that after you do all the work just put caching layers in the different modules and have them be fairly decoupled from from your modules themselves so leave caching as the last result after you build the entire system after you optimize everything then insert these caching layers um, and that will make it really easy to to scale and test and uh, and protect against bugs uh, disk caches are incredibly tricky to deal with um, and like there are a few issues that I mentioned before and they have a lot more issues so leave it to the last thing so when you have a process that um, wants to write to disk cache and then when it comes back up again wants to read from that disk cache try to avoid it if you have to proceed with caution so, um, and finally, uh, I want to leave you with some additional safety advice that has helped me in, in building reliable uh, systems. Um, uh, for a well-defined problem or system, you, instead of jumping into code, if you kind of know what you have to do, maybe you've already built something, but it wasn't reliable enough, you want to rewrite it, just open a document and start designing a protocol of how all the different parts of the system can talk to each other. And then, ideally, because you understand the system, you understand the types. Try to use static typing in this case. And, and I'll, I'll show that in JavaScript, there are a few options out there that you can use for static typing. Um, I am a dynamic uh, type, uh, typing guy, and I, I really like the flexibility. But I think for a well-defined set of problems, it's, it's awesome to, to use type checkers. So here's an example that I recently, it's a side project that I have. Uh, it's a REPL protocol. Um, uh, basically, I have this uh, site called REPLit. And um, uh, it originally, when, I, when we wrote this, we compiled all the interpreters to JavaScript. So Python, Ruby, everything was running in the browser. But um, uh, after a while, these uh, interpreters became old. So we had Ruby 1.8, we had Python. 2.7 and you know people wanted the new ones I didn't have time or energy to mess around with M script and again it's uh, it's a lot of work um, and I also wanted to do something on the server um, so so uh, I, I decided to run the user code on my servers as opposed to on the client um, I'll see if the Wi-Fi is working but um, uh, this is basically making a round trip to the server and then coming back and, and, and printing. And you can also read things uh, from, from the client. So uh, input name. Um, and uh, I, can, I can show you the WebSocket connection so we can see how, we can, how we're talking to the server. Okay, so, so just one plus one. And if we open the socket con connection, we look at the frames, this is what's happening. Um, there's an authorization um, command going on and the authorization result. And there's a select language message, it's Python 3, and the command ready, just saying that we're ready for, for uh, evaluation. And then the command eval, one plus one, um, one plus one, and then the result two, and then there's like pings and pongs. Um, so this is a, a well-defined problem. Like I exactly know what I need to do. So I opened the document and started designing this protocol. So I'm not gonna go through uh, this thing, but basically I just put in examples. It's like, oh, the server will say it's ready, then the client will, will, will say eval one plus one, and then the server will say result two. And I went through a couple of examples, and then I uh, solidified my, my design as a state machine, uh, just in text. Just a, there's a start state, um, 
and then after we get a ready state from the server, uh, we go to the ready state, which is here. After we get a ready state, if we get an eval message going out, we go to the eval state. In eval, multiple things can happen. We can do an output, we can do an input, we can have a result, and every one of these will go to a different state. So if we get a result, we'll go back to ready state. Uh, if, if, uh, if we get an output, we go back to the same state. It's, it's, uh, I should have drawn this, but it's a, it's a self-returning. It's like a finite state machine. You can draw it. Um, so this is this is really interesting implementation detail. I just want to see if I have time. Yeah, um, I saw this talk by um, by Rob Pike, the the designer of Golang, and he did something extremely cool. I can't. It's just like one of the most beautiful programs that I've seen. Um, I, he designed a state machine by using just functions. And so we declare a type. So I'm using here flow type. Flow type is a type tracker by Facebook. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm declaring a type called state function. And state function is a function that returns a promise, and that promise will return a state function. So it's a recur recursive definition. Here's my run loop. If you remember run loops from before, they're basically looping forever. In this case, I, I, I start with a state, which is the start, the, the state start, should have been start state. So it's a start state, which is a function that I'll show in a little bit. And then as I go through my loop, what I do is I basically, I basically await, it's an async function, await the next state call. So state is a function that returns a state. So as you can see, I keep going through the state until some problems happen. So the machine keeps going until maybe a stop or a halting event or, or a, a broken state happens. So here's how I define my functions. So here's the, the state start. Um, as you can see, it returns a state function as well. Um, it will read a message. This is the, the initial start. Uh, uh, and that message should be select language because that's the first thing that you do. You want to select a language. And then after that, it will read another message from the server. We're treating client and server message as the same, in the same queue, basically. Um, and it works really well. If the message is not ready, then I'll throw an error. So basically, I'm checking all the states all the time. And then if everything passes, and every time uh, I, I just block uh, on, on the message reading, um, if everything passes, I'll return the next function to execute as, as my state. The next function is state ready, and um, it will read a message if that me message is not eval, eval, because the only thing that can happen, the only event in that state that can happen is eval. If that message is not eval, I'll throw an error, unexpected state, and that'll help me debug. If, if it was eval, I'll return the next handler, state handler. So the next state handler is state eval, which also returns a state function. Um, and it will wait for the next message. And it'll have a small s a switch case here. If the next message is result, I will call some callback that is waiting for my result. Uh, and then we'll return to the, to the ready state. And, and then if the, if the, if the um, next one, if the event is output, I will just uh, write to the to whatever is waiting on I output and then return to the eval state. So, to me, that's a, that's a great way to implement this algorithm. But also the fact that you can implement this, a finite state machine using using just functions as your states. Uh, the functions are both state handlers and the state themselves is just like amazing to me. Um, and I guess an empty slides mean that I'm done. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, do you have any questions? Um, I have uh, yeah, you can you can use it without any any compilation for ES6 um, 
environments, but for anything ES5, you have to compile. Um, it works really nicely. I am not as familiar uh, with COA and all the CO and all the other things to make a, uh, to make a really um, uh, a good observation here, but um, I think the concept of channels is much more important than the other things. Everything else doesn't, uh, I think, just relies mainly in core routines. Um, uh, and and this can can have multiple different processes talking to each other. Yeah, it's exactly that. Yeah. Cool. All right. Thank you, guys. <laughs>